Hey, 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 welcome into another episode of Halos in the Infield podcast with your host, Todd Fox, and the other host of the show. Fernando Mendez, let me hit you with an unenthusiastic, angry, viva Los Angelitos. More like muerte Los Angelitos, dude. They're playing like a, like a dead team. Man, I mean, we have so much to talk about in this one. We're going to try to like not go too far off the rails, but I will say yeah. as an Angels fan, I am in frustration mode level 11 out of 10 right now. Yeah, you know, it's definitely one of those times that you're starting to see even like the Joe Madden apologists come out and be like, it's time to fire this dude. Mm -hmm. I think right now, uh, I mentioned on the post game uh, that, you know, people are, are doing, you know, like you said, right now, there's a battle going on right now between Angel fans. It's one side is just saying the sky is falling. Everything sucks. Bring up this guy, bring up that guy fire Joe Madden and then the and then the uh the honks out there are like hey don't me don't mess with my manager everything's good we're just in a slump right now we're going to turn things around 2002 you know <laughs> that's where yeah. we're at yeah right it's that super it's like that 2016 you know not my manager <laughs> Joe Madden is not my manager yeah yeah still I mean your manager he's still your manager <laughs> <laughs> What what do you think's going on, my man? Um, it, obviously, right now, as the time of this recording, we're in an eight game losing streak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it feels like it's like twenty, mm -hmm. eight going on twenty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. Honestly, I, if I did know what was going on, I'd probably be getting paid a lot more money, as would you. Mm -hmm. You know, to be managing this team. But man, oh man, it's like this team is just playing super flat. And it's not even like, we said that so many times last year. We recorded this podcast super depressed last year when we were just on some of those really long losing streaks. But nothing felt as bad as it currently does. Maybe it's because we were spoiled by the first, you know, six to seven weeks of the season where the Angels were losing a couple games, but they're playing some good baseball. And now it's kind of our first taste back to mediocrity for a week. So maybe that's why it feels worse. But man, oh man, I don't remember the team ever looking this flat last year. Yeah, that's the thing. To piggyback off what you said, I mean, this is the most talent we've seen too. So it's like we can accept yeah. when they were losing because they had injuries or no talent, but they've got talent up and down this roster. And just over a week ago, they were ranked uh, in the top five as far as power rankings by several yeah. organizations. And, and they even dropped down to eight to start the week, which isn't bad still. Yeah, exactly. And their and their team ERA was at 307 a week and a half ago or about 20 games ago. Now the ERA has just crossed over into 400 or a 4. four. Um they're 6 and 16 in their last 22. And you know, they uh, despite that they were 27 and 17 in a mediocre stretch of 14 games when they were 6 and 8. And now they're they're, you know, they put themselves behind the the uh, currently they're 6 and a half behind Houston. So, and they're right in the mix of all the wild card teams. It's it, it, it. I feel you, dude. This year is completely different from the other years, man. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the lineup and you look at the average numbers, like they're not absolutely horrible. I mean, Red Heath is batting two seventy one. Marsh is batting two seventy. I mean, you'll take that out of those guys. Mm -hmm. Kurt Suzuki, really, you don't really have to even look at his every. I mean, he's batting 196, but, you know, he's kind of just there to take a spot. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's a backup catcher. Tyler Wade's kind of been a disaster all season long. Andrew Velasquez, um, you have him for his defense, but, man, oh, man, has he been shooting himself in the foot offensively these last couple of games against the Yankees? You know, oh, he's going back to the Bronx to play in his, you know, home borough where all the trash is sitting in New York and all the overrated ass food that has no parking. And here he is making his return to the Bronx and he shat the bed, shat it hard, shat it like a three year old who just got out of his diapers. Yeah, I think he shot it like the like the three year old or the two year old that's uh, in the playpen too long and it's up his back right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that happened to my son, dude. The very first time he went to Universal Studios, he went on like one of those motion simulator rides and he got so scared that he oh. shat himself and it went up his back. Um, I, I think yeah, every, that was a, every parent's had one of those because I had one one. Like, yeah, well, your kids just had a blow up and like in like an inconvenient time. <laughs> yeah. It's like crying. I'm like, bro, we're on a ride. I can't just change you right now. 
Because at first you're like, oh, man, that smells really bad. I got to change your diaper in a minute. And then you're like, whoa, that's uh, that's in your shirt. <laughs> yeah, you're like, well, not only am I changing the diaper, this shirt's going in the trash, and I got to go buy you a new one for $25 in a gift shop. <laughs> yeah, you're getting a new outfit. We're going to give you an impromptu bath, everything. Yeah, um, right. Like a little, you know, a little, I, I don't want to use it. You know, a little hooker shower. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't want to use inappropriate sh- language. I'm like, eh. You're all, eh. Who am I kidding? <laughs> It's the angels right now. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, but but now getting back to it, like this team um, has been completely frustrating in many ways. And, and like you bring up Squid, and I brought up on the post game show, you know, it seemed like this team was more concerned before the road trip, two days before, on what they're going to wear, what kind of pictures that Squid had when he was wearing in high school jerseys. They want to emulate him, uh, shirts passing out. It's like for a two hundred hitter. You know, and I understand his defense is fantastic. I love him out there defensively, but let's put it to you this way. The Angels have put themselves in a situation to where they're a National League team again. And why do I say that? Because the National League got away and from having their pitchers hit, and that was an automatic out, so they have a DH now. The Angels are like, no, let's give ourselves an automatic out. And it's not just him, too. I mean, he's an automatic out because it seems like he's up there with all the pressure situations. I've seen him come up um, in the last two weeks three times with a chance to win the game or tie it, and he shit the bed three times there. And you're having automatic outs with Suzuki and a couple other guys. And then your power hitters who are supposed to be dominating with that murderous row the Angels are supposed to have. They're, they're not there at all. They've never clicked at all this season. I mean, I will give... Joe Madden, this, I mean, in terms of like your first four batters for the final game of that Yankees doubleheader, I mean, Ward, Otani, Trout, and Walsh, I mean, at least he didn't bat, you know, Otani leadoff, bat Ward like seven. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you never know with Joe, you know, sleepy Joe. (laughs) But, uh, I mean, I'm still putting uh, probably Ranjifo second. I don't like, I told you, man, I'm a big proponent of putting your fastest guys one and two. Mm-hmm. I understand Otani's fast, but you know, in theory, he's there to drive in runs. That's why you have him, especially when he's only batting 244. Oh, yeah. All you want him to do is drive in a run on a sacrifice fly to, with the warning track, uh, you know, pop out or, you know, get lucky and drag a ball. I, I, I don't know, man. I'm honestly just flattering my words because just I, I'm frustrated. And there's like really nothing productive to talk about here. We're not talking about productive games. We're not talking about productive uh, outs. We're not talking about the team having timely hitting. We're not even talking about them trying to come back and win some of these games. We're talking about this, them just falling flat on their face game after game after game. Like you said, it's eight games. And like I said, it feels like it's 20. They This team just feels so out of it. Joe Madden lost his clubhouse in 2020 and seemingly never got it back. And he's just there like, oh, no problem, bro. Who wants to come in my van? Yeah, who wants to take a ride? It, it's – it's. I got to ask you this too, man. Uh, I've no. never – you know, because before the, the narrative with the Yankees and the Angels always comes up is, you know, going back as long as I can remember, the Angels would have a shit record, but they always play the Yankees good. They're always right there with the Yankees. They go to Yankee Stadium, Andy Pettit, Jeter, all those guys, Roger Clemens, they still couldn't beat the Angels even though they won 100 games. Where was that in this series? You, bro, we scored one run three times in a hitter's ballpark. What do you think about that? Yeah, in a Little League ballpark. Exactly. I mean, at least Baltimore pushed their left field back and where it's they're trying to be a, a major yeah. league ballpark. But what do you think about the Angels who usually score a lot of runs in that Yankee Stadium doing nothing? All I know, man, is next time the Angels go out of Yankee Stadium, maybe I'll uh, send them some products so they can do some jobs for me over there. They fucking earn their paychecks for a game because they weren't doing anything this entire series. It was a laughing stock, a joke. It was embarrassing. The Angels on, you know, I understand these weren't nationally televised games, but when you're playing the Yankees, that's basically a nationally televised thing, right? I mean, the Yankees are the most well-known baseball team on the planet. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, kind of like, you know, the Cowboys or the Raiders even with football, you know, those are the teams that like you can pull uh, somebody who's never watched a game of football. They probably know those teams. Somebody who's never watched baseball. They probably know the Yankees. So the Angels are there on that grand stage of Yankee Stadium. And this time, completely unproductive games. 
they only had one opportunity and that was game three of uh, the yeah, game three, which was uh, game two of the doubleheader because yesterday's game was rained out and they buttercuped us. They buttercuped us. Yep. The king of the buttercups. <laughs> and what was sad about the buttercup is they didn't even give us a half inning to celebrate Suzuki's lucky hit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, as soon as they came back from yeah. commercial, we got to give up the lead. You know, yeah, right. It's like um, you know, like when when you watch WWE, and it's like you know, like you know, the Miz is getting his ass kicked by whatever Mark Henry, and they're like, "Oh, we'll be right back after this." You know, it goes to like a minute or two minute long commercial break, and then like it goes back to the match, and all of a sudden, like the Miz is kicking Mark Henry's ass. You're like, "What the hell happened?" It was just a commercial break. <laughs> and you're like, "Where's well, what you missed during the commercial break?" And freaking, you know, Mark Henry found out he got he got like. So he's terminally ill, but he you know, overcame it to win this match. And, you know, oh, there was a presidential election and oh, all this shit happened like two minutes. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> it was a commercial. It was like that, dude. You know what I mean? Like you're sitting there, you answer a text message. You're like, oh, I'm going to run to the bathroom. Can you come back? The angels are getting their ass kicked. You know, it, it, sure. It was only one run. It was two one because of that Anthony Rizzo hit. But two one in this series felt like an ass beating. It did. And and I got to ask you something, too. When it comes to the pitching, correct me if I'm wrong, but last year you would you would see guys pitch back to back games. You would see guys pitch multiple innings that were accustomed to only one inning this year. Joe said it was an organizational thing not to pitch guys no matter what back to back games, multiple innings. Who's lying? Is is he lying or is it Perry? Um, I'm sorry. Is he lying or is it Perry changing the culture? Because obviously we're seeing different approaches from last year to this year. I, I, I could see that being a Perry move. I could very much see that being a Perry move. I feel like Perry is the kind of guy who's like, okay, well, Joe, you know, Archie Bradley isn't meant to pitch six innings mm -hmm. and he's not meant to pitch two innings after pitching six innings the day before. Yeah. <laughs> and Joe Madden's like, uh, bro, peace and love, bro. Peace and love. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand the problem here. And then he's like, come on, back me up here. Artie and Artie's like, I love scotch. <laughs> I hope the Arizona Coyotes leave Arizona. You know, so, <laughs> something like that. Well, well, I was thinking, I was thinking, is this, is this a thing that he's coddling these pitchers too much, man? Because I mean, obviously, you had a situation tonight where you could have went to a lefty, even though he pitched the night before. I mean, we just saw Toronto come into Anaheim Stadium and pitch a Romano three games straight, and they they wound up pitching him the day after they left here as well. They didn't pitch him in the finale, but he pitched four out of five games, and last I checked, his arm is still intact. It's It hasn't fallen off. Oh, that's a, well, remember, Joe Madden's like 30 pitches. All right. Well, let me ask you this respectfully. And I ask this to the listeners too. Does it matter? Who on earth could he have pitched over the last eight games consecutively that you would have been comfortable with? Respectfully, does it matter? I, I will say, I will say this. It does. If you keep people in their roles and you know, I agree what roles right now, Todd, what roles? <laughs> the team is not winning. There is no pitcher. You know, you don't actually Tapera and Loop actually did a decent job in game three of the series. They, they didn't do that bad, right? They actually came in and held the bullpen that they're supposed to. We've been clamoring for, hey, maybe Ortega should get a high leverage role, right? Mm -hmm. You've said it and I've said it. Hey, you know, he's been doing pretty good. Maybe we should give him a chance. And, of course, he wanted to make an ass out of you and an ass out of me. And he did that. He, he it, it, and it worked. It worked. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, you know, bring up a good point because it just seems like no matter who they pitch, in the end, we still got to score runs. And um, with the lineup, if you would have told me that we would have been in a situation right now to where, okay, we run into a stretch where we're not scoring, I get it. That happens to all major league baseball teams. Course, but to know. see the level that they're not hitting and now how prolonged it is, like it seemed like they were able to get away with it in the beginning of the season. And again, like other teams adjusted to us. Now we're having trouble pitching. We wanted our hitting to overcompensate that. 
and get us over the hill that way. And they've really not done anything. And I think the, the, the term that is, I think fitting in with everything I'm thinking of is shitting the bed. And we've said that n- multiple times at the start of this podcast uh, on this episode. And I think it's just another reason why to use that term. They shit the bed again, uh, hitting in the last 22 games. I mean, I can't, I just can't express how bad they've been in situational hitting because they haven't put, they haven't tried it. It's just, it continues to be swing for the fences while everyone else does the impossible we can't do. Yeah. It gets aggravating, man. I mean, what we almost got no hit. Yeah. Game three. Yeah. You perfect. Know, perfect picture. Uh, how do you, yeah. Perfect game. How do you say his name? Taylor Taylor to high end. That also sounds wrong, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. Well, I, Mr. I T. Terry said tie on or something like that. So I think it was tie on. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Eight innings pitch, two hits, one run, one earned run. I think it was what through seven. Yes. Was it seven perfect innings? Seven perfect innings. Uh, five strikeouts, and he now has an ERA of 2.30. And man, oh man, it's not even just that. You know, it was the game, even game one of the uh, doubleheader, where Otani got lit up in New York yet again. Cortez went out there and pitched like he was Cy Young incarnate. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'll say no on Ryan. Cy Young wasn't as great as, you know, maybe the name would entail because of the award. But seven innings pitch, five hits, no earned runs, two walks, seven strikeouts. And Cortez now has an ERA of 1.50. And, and he picked off Dude. Otani. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, you know, normally a pretty good base runner. Mm-hmm. But on top of everything, man, it's like it's just frustrating. A, a baseball bat? Get this team a freaking cricket oar, and yes. they still might not make contact. Give them a paddle, and they still might not be hitting the ball. They're going up there trying to swing the ball like they're Vladimir Guerrero Sr. in his prime, trying to hit balls off the dirt, and it worked for him, but it's not working for these guys. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, they're not eating into the bullpen. They are not having productive at bats. Mm-hmm. They are not playing small ball. They're not trying to like, oh, well, I'm going to rut right now. Maybe I should bunt the guy who got on first over to second. At least give the next guy a chance. Nope. Nothing at all. We're going for the bomb, baby. And the best part, when we get it, it's a solo shot. Yeah, exactly. We're not doing what runners on. I think in the post game too, Dan Rios was saying, man, uh, we had a runner at first and in a bunting situation pop up you know we're 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 popping up it's it's really it's really bad to see this team continually not do the things that other teams are doing to manufacture runs because that's always the fallback if you're if your hitting is not doing good you're in slumps you go back to the basics this team isn't going back to the basics they're doing the same damn thing over and over and over and it's not working and right now to score three i mean look i'll just say this jameson tyon uh, Terry Smith in the pregame was saying, uh, basically, this guy throws strikes. So in frustration, because sometimes you could hear Terry be frustrated. He really loves his team. And, and and Terry Smith's a radio guy for the Angels here locally. And he literally said in the pregame, the scouting report on James, on James Ty, Ty, Jameson Tyon, or whatever you say the name, is he throws strikes. And he's not going to mess around. He, he, he uh, said he's only had one walk in his last four games. So he's going to be around the strike Jesus. zone. Yeah, be aggressive, right? And he says there's no need to take strikes. Hmm, what happened in the game? They took a lot of strikes. <laughs> they struck out, and uh, yet they weren't aggressive. So Terry can see it. We can see it. And, again, everyone on the staff drops the ball with teaching these guys. Yeah, it's almost like these guys, like the players hear these like scouting reports from like, you know, either Gooby or Terry Smith or Mark Langston. And they're like, oh, that's good advice. (laughs) I'm not going to do that, though. You know what I mean? (laughs) Take strikes. Uh, No, I'm going to swing at everything possible. Or I'm going to take a bunch of strikes. I'm not going to be aggressive. I'm going to be passive. You know what I mean? Like almost the complete opposite of what's said. Um. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm at a complete loss for words. So let me ask you this. I'm going to ask the million dollar question. Mm-hmm. 
or should I say the multi-million dollar question? Because this guy probably wanted a payday. Shohei Otani, is he quickly working his way out of a big contract? I understand we're still early on in the season, but man, oh man, those last like two starts have been horrendous. I don't think so. And it's it's a two-way right. answer because he's working himself out of a big contract here. I think teams would clamor and overpay him to get him out of here. So even though he's not having a back-to-back MVP season, whether it's with his bat or his, his arm, I think teams would love to have him on their squad regardless. So let's just say the Angels would be like, you know what? Uh, the last couple of years after the MVP season, this is your contract year. You've been uh, me- You've been above average, but you haven't been great. So we'll throw you because you're a two-way player. We'll throw you like a Rendon contract. He's going to say no because you're going to have a team on the East Coast be like, hey, man, you're worth it. You're internationally famous. We want you here. You could flourish here. $400 million. We'll lose them. And it, will be because, and it won't be because, let's just say we make the playoffs, but because it's his stats went down here, we're not going to want to pay him because we've seen what he could do. Other teams aren't going to be like that. They're going to think they're going to get the best of Otani. They're going to get MVP Otani, and I think that's what they'll pay for. It's rough, man, because we either get the Rookie of the Year Otani, mm-hmm. the MVP Otani, or a guy who's either average or just absolute dog shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I get it. Well, season's still fairly early, but that's only an excuse for so long. I can only say that for so long. Yeah. He's batting what, like 247? Yeah, he's, I, I was exactly right. I looked <laughs> So, yeah, I guess. I knew he was in the 250 range. So, yeah, he's batting 247. And as of after today's start, three innings pitched, eight hits, four runs, all earned, one walk, two strikeouts, 3.99 ERA. Now, so he hasn't been hitting great this year, but at least his pitching was pretty solid, right? Like, okay, hey, he was a good pitcher. At the end of the day, the Angels need pitching, not hitting anyway. But you know, his batting's average, literally. I mean, what, the major league average is about two, 255? Mm-hmm. And he's just under that. He'll hover around 255 for the year. I'm not worried about that. But, uh, yeah, that ERA, man, is killer. Like, you're you're supposed to be one of the aces of this staff, if not the ace. And right now, you're pitching like a dude who wants to head over to Salt Lake, which I know won't happen. But, you know, with the 4.0 ERA, when you can't even make it through four innings, Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask you two quick questions real quick. Otani, Otani, New York, your opinions. This is two starts in New York, and the first one he didn't finish an inning last year. This one only three innings. Do you think it is the pressure of New York? Oh, I, I, It's probably a loaded question. I, I'm not sure. You know, I've never seen him play in New York. I would like to for the simple fact is I want to read his body language. Mm-hmm. Body language in baseball is everything, and, you know, uh, these games happen when I'm working a lot of the time, you know what I mean? Because um, coincidentally, I've never, I, I go to New York once a month. I've never been there during um, a, a New York trip. Um, and it'd be nice to see them there, but man, I, I want to see if his demeanor changes. I, I can't even watch on TV. Most of the time I'm, I'm listening on the radio, but um, maybe it is the bright lights. The Maybe it's the concrete jungle. Maybe it's the rats. Maybe it's the trash. Who knows? Okay, and then and then it's the traffic. That could be. Second question on Otani: Was it a right move? Was or was it an excuse? Or yeah, was it a right move to say it, or was it an excuse? And how do you feel about Joe Madden's basically coming out saying he was tipping his pitches? I thought Joe Madden said he wasn't. Um, they asked him about him, and they asked him about was it Noah Syndergaard? They asked him about both. Yeah, but he he came out saying that Otani was tipping his pitches. He feels like he was tipping his pitches. I thought I heard him say they're good hitters. And they're like, does that mean that you think they, they're tipping their pitches? And Joe Maddon just said they're good hitters. Well, That's what I thought he said. No, nah, well, I got the quote. Someone sent it to me that he said he feels that Otani was tipping his pitches. So do you think that's good <laughs> for a manager to call out his player like that? Or, or do you think that that was an excuse? I don't know, man. The thing with Otani is um, he's got a really great splitter. Everyone talks about how good the splitter is. Everyone talks about how good the fastball is. 
Mm-hmm. But a lot of the times, his fastball, when it's, you know, high 90s or in the hundreds, mm-hmm. he throws it up in the zone. If you lay off and you know he's going to throw it, he'll lay off all day. Same thing with the splitter. Once you start sitting on the splitter and you know it's going to go down in the, you know, in the dirt, that's basically where the splitter normally ends up, and you stop swinging that pitch, all of a sudden you're going to start getting walked a lot. Mm-hmm. Otani hardly ever attacks the strike zone with the two strike count. Hardly ever. It's true. He always tries to get people chasing. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it's great, and sometimes it really doesn't. And he just, you know, look at those last two starts. Oh, what he's got a combined like four innings pitch in his last two starts, something like that. Yeah, four now, or five innings. That was after about I think he put a string together of like five starts in a row of double digit strikeouts or close to it. So yeah, he's he's definitely fallen off. Uh, it's it's really really. I, I have it pulled up here for after. Okay. Uh, f- so five eighteen, he pitched six innings, gave up two runs, five twenty six against Toronto at home, six innings pitched, gave up five runs, and then right now three innings pitched, gave up four runs. Oh okay. Yeah, so it's, what, it's eleven earned runs in his last three starts. God damn! See, that's a, that's a huge, huge problem. Huge it's problem. Bad. Very bad. And you know, you look at his walks. We're talking about four combined walks in his last three starts. Otani does tend to have some control issues at times, mm-hmm. and that's not the problem. Four walks then in three starts. That's pretty damn good, actually. That is. That is. It's just, it's just a little. Is his control's been there, but like I think his sequence of pitches. Because again, this was brought up in the in the the post game as well. I keep referencing it, but there was a lot of good talk tonight because there was a lot of frustration. People said, "Hey, look, Wallach was hitting worse than Squid," but when Wallach was in there, it seemed like the pitchers were hitting their spots a lot better. And I can't argue that because Suzuki, I've 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 been saying it, you've been saying it. He's not. The team doesn't win usually when he's in there. Stassi, they do a pretty decent job, but you know um, he's allergic to playing every game or every other game, even. Uh, you know, so he's not out there. But when Wallach was out there, it just seemed like they were playing better baseball, dude. You know, like the the pitchers were more in control of things, and now it just seems like they're you know because this isn't the the Mike Sosha I'm calling every pitch literally from the dugout you know he they give the the catchers a game plan with a wristband and they're the ones making the calls and you could tell that that wallach right now i I think out of all of the catchers they've had up this year he's called the best games all season so let me ask you this uh because i'm starting to see a lot of it and even people who were against him by the time he left there's a lot of people who are like man i was wrong about mike sosha and i miss him are you one of those people now who you're starting to get to that point where you're like, maybe we did have a good with Mike Sosha. We just took it for granted because we were losing so much when it wasn't his fault. Um, I would say that I think Mike Sosha still would have won with, with some of the player additions if they were done right, like they're do, done right now. But I think it was, he was a product of his own ego. It was time for him to go. Uh, I, 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 I'm not willing to say, oh, I want him back right now. I just missed some of the things that he did preach to the team. Like the game passed him by. He was never in analytic analytics. I did. I wasn't crazy about him calling every pitch, but I did like the fact that they would lay down bunts, suicide squeeze, uh, squeezes, hit and runs, um, stealing bases, preaching good defense and preaching smart at bats. I mean, you could look at every social team analytics aside when the game dictated a need to be speedy on the bases, he changed the game plan mid game. When the game plan dictated, uh, we need to go deep right here. or We need, we need a, a, a gap or something. He dictated that. And yeah, sometimes it wouldn't work and you would lose anyway. But the fact of the matter is they would try different things during the game and adjust. And I think I miss his adjustments more than anything. I miss the fact that he wouldn't just sit on his ass and and let the game play out, you know, from the start. He he literally would be like, okay, it's the fifth inning. It's getting kind of late. We're down three. We got to we gotta spark something. And that's what I miss, to be honest. Yeah, I wasn't a big, you know, I loved Sosha. And then, you know, as soon as, like, you know, 2017 kind of wore on, I was like, okay. And then 2018 happened, and I was like, all right, yeah, this guy's got to go. And obviously he got 
not fired, but he got let go. His contract didn't get renewed. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm tired of the Angels going after guys who have like been managing before. You know, we've kind of started to see these players that I've told you about, these younger guys who are kind of taught the Angels way, and those guys are coming up, having a little bit more fun, and, you know, they're kind of starting to take the team by storm. You know, Patrick Sandoval, with the exception of his last start, pretty good lately. Oh, yeah. You know, and then you have some of these other guys, you know, who have been brought up in the system. You know, Brandon Marsh is still fairly productive. I mean, I'll take 270 out of a guy like him all, uh, you know, all day. So what I'm saying is that these guys who have been taught Angels baseball, you know, they believe in the system because this is the system they came up in. So it'd be nice to have a new manager to come up and have their own brand of baseball instead of trying to get this, you know, the the Madonna of baseball regurgitated by every team, you know, slept with this guy, that guy, you know what I mean? It's like that here with the managers, you know, we had, you know, Mike Socha was a young and hungry manager when he came here. He was productive. He won a World Series, made it to multiple playoffs. And then as the team started to give him less and less help, and then they started digging the recycling bin for players, you know, it started to dry up on him. And, you know, it was his time. But I don't necessarily blame Socha as much as I blame, you know, maybe already green lighting some of these bargain bin moves, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, Billy Epler was making, or even Jerry DePoto was making, like in 2015, where he traded for David DeJesus at the trade deadline to replace Josh Hamilton. But, um, and Shane Victorino. Oh, but uh, I digress. Yes. Yeah, I digress. But um, you know what I mean? And then we got Brad Osmus, who was with the Tigers before. And then he came here, not productive. And then we got Joe Madden, who at the time, I think we'll all, we all would all admit that we were excited at the time, right? I mean, I understand that Chicago had kind of, you know, thrown him to the side because they were kind of tired of him and his mismanagement of the bullpen. And he almost cost the Cubs that 2016 World Series. That's what a lot of people forget. He was a using and abusing Aroldis Chapman. Yeah. And they almost lost because of the mismanagement and misuse of Aroldis Chapman, who at the time was the best closer in baseball. And that's why he went back to New York as well. He couldn't stand it there in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, you know, I'm right there with you. I don't want to retread. I want a diamond in the rough, like Sosha was. And uh, we get we get a guy like that that's gonna gonna take the league by storm. I'm all for it. Um, you know, Benji Molina. <laughs> hey, never know. Hey, next year. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just there's a lot of ways that this could go down. Um, but but yeah, I was excited when Joe was there when he did the press conference initially. I thought, man, he's come back home. He's going to take this team to the next level. You see his track record. You kind of forgot about the Chicago thing, even though it was recent. And you, But you focused in on he won a World Series there. He got Tampa Bay, a team that nobody thought would ever do anything in this league. Perennial 100-game loser year after year. And he got them into the perennial team that they are. I mean, Joe literally has that organization built because of the way he ran things and also the previous general manager there. But I digress. I think at this time, um, it's time for a change. I mean, we, we, I don't like firing people, but I've said it before. I'll say it again. Managers are hired to be become fired at some point. Only the greats get to walk away when they want. And, uh, you know, I think Joe's not a great, he's good, but, but he's not a great. And I think his flaws and everything are coming to the surface right now. And maybe this is just not the team that he thought it was that he could mold into what he wanted it to be. I think he'll get in the baseball hall of fame for the simple fact of breaking the Cubs curse. That's true. I think that kind of gives him an automatic pass. You know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. Put him in the baseball hall of fame as a manager because of that. But, uh, and I, I think social belongs there too, but that's a different topic for maybe the off season. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe it's time. I mean, I don't know who they would fi- who they would hire, and I certainly don't think they're going to fire Joe in the middle of the season. I think, unfortunately, he's kind of earned the ability to see it through. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, even if the Angels make the playoffs, I, I just don't know how I feel about this being Joe Madden's team with an extension because this is his last year under contract. Mm-hmm. 
I, I just, man, you know, if they make the playoffs, I really don't think they let him go under any circumstance. But I, if it was up to me, I, I wouldn't see any circumstance as to why I'd keep him around. I mean, he's older. Even if the Angels make the playoffs or have some success in the playoffs and make some noise, even if they don't win a World Series, but let's just say they make it the championship round, I'd still just going to be like, cool, man, there you go, right on top. I honestly am, I'm honestly that right there with you. I I actually think that Perry already either has somebody in mind or or he feels that like he's got to make a change because these GMs, you know it more than than I do, is or as well as I do, is like they want their own guy in there. I don't think Joe was his guy. And and I, I really, really think Perry is gonna bring in his guy. I even think unless the Angels make the ALCS. I, I don't think Madden's coming back. So let's just say they write the ship, they play good, they win 90 games and get in the postseason, but they get bounced in that first round. Or they win some games and go into a long series. I don't I don't think he's coming back, dude. I really don't. Time will tell, I guess. I mean, you know, we're still pretty early on. Um, let me ask you a question about a guy who a lot of Angels fans were excited about, Noah Syndergaard. So – he was pitching great, and then his last couple starts have been a stinker. So May 16th at Texas, point two innings pitched, gave up four earned runs. Super mm-hmm. flat start, did not last long, clearly. 524 at home against Texas, bounced back, eight innings pitched, uh, one earned run. And that was a day where a lot of people thought he was going to go for the complete game, but he didn't get the opportunity to. And then, of course, game one of this series, which was May 31st against the Yankees, 2.1 innings pitched, five earned runs. What on earth is happening to Noah Syndergaard right now? Todd, you can give him a bowling ball up there and tell him to throw it to the home plate, and he's not going to get any strikes right now. What's going on? You know, and before all this happened, Matt Wise was like, we were championing how good, championing how good he was and how he's working with his staff. I don't know if it's the, the pitching coach, but you know that. But I think what I've seen is the locations have been off uh, in a lot of these pitchers, with the exception of Lorenzen. I think, uh, and and a little bit Sandoval. His last start, Sandoval was rough too, as you brought out. But as far as Syndergaard, I think his 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 pinpoint accuracy, especially when he's up in the count, two strikes. He tends to leave those fastballs or sliders right out over the plate, and he's getting hammered. Or when he needs a strike like he was throwing earlier in the season down 2-1 the count or something like that, he's misplacing it and it's down and away to a right-handed hitter or it's just in the dirt, he's overthrowing it. Uh, I, so I think it could be mechanical right now. Uh, I don't think it's any kind of arm issue or anything else like that. I just think his mechanics are a little bit off and uh, he needs to get refocused because he came back in between the last two bad starts and pitched a very good eight inning game against Texas. Um, So I think, I think it's just, you know, like someone said earlier, uh, winning's contagious and slumps are contagious. And this entire team is on a slump right now. And that could be playing into it. Yeah, I I could agree with that. Um, We, you, you had brought it up right now that we were talking about Matt Wise and how he's a genius. He's done a great job and we were wrong about him. And uh, naturally we jinxed him. (laughs) <laughs> so because of that, here's where we really find out what Matt Wise is capable of and what he is capable of doing with his staff. Agreed. Because right now there is almost no pitcher start in the starting rotation or in the bullpen who's firing in all cylinders. You know, like I said, you had to pair and Luke kind of turn it around in game three, came in for an inning each, held, uh, held the score, got a hold. They did their job. Great. Perfect what I need you to do but you know we're also talking about loop what two or three straight times before that shit in the bed Ryan to pair lately shit in the bed you know we haven't gotten to see much of Rysel lately because they're on an eight game losing streak mm-hmm. uh the starters nobody's pitching well I mean Lorenzen's kind of the exception but even he hasn't been great lately he's been serviceable but you know so when he's serviceable and he's your best starting pitcher at the moment that's where the red flags start to come up he's been having a great season he's been proving to people that he does deserve to be a starter and i will eat crow on that but that doesn't change the fact that right now man this entire team all around all the starters both in the lineup 
the rotation and even the bullpen pieces all struggling, man. Exactly. With the exception of one guy, I will say this. One guy. Pedro Velasquez? No. (laughs) Joe Madden? No. One guy has cobwebs on his arm right now because he's so not used right now. Jimmy Hergit. What the hell happened to that guy? He was pitching great. He pitched today, right? In game three. No, but, but I mean, like, he, up until today, what, did he pitch today? That meant, Pretty sure he did. Pretty sure he pitched game three. Because I haven't seen him, and he was, he's was he been our, like, Scott Shields. Like, if we need him on a consecutive days, multiple innings, he's there, doesn't complain. He pitched today. One inning pitched. Well, see, well, he knocked the cobwebs off, but where was he in this losing streak, dude? He hasn't pitched much since the Texas series. So let's see. So he pitched his last three games 520 versus Oakland, 527 versus Toronto, and then yeah, six dash two. Yeah. So I mean, you're you're you have guys that are capable of getting outs. I even would have wanted him to pitch in the high stakes situation tonight in the game two. But uh I mean, hey, high stakes 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It's it's just it's just frustrating because like right now. Even though we we crush Madden, I I even think he's frustrated. He's seeing the Maybe. writing on the wall and how, how things aren't going right. You know, like it's got to be frustrating. I mean, look, you go from we knew Houston was going to be tough. We knew they were going to go on a run. They went on a run early in the season. They won like eleven in a row. Um, you know, and then we knew that when we hit our tough spot, they were going to be hitting their easy spot. And right now they're hitting their easy spot and they're still, you know, they're getting by, they're winning. But I mean, you go from, we're right there with them. We're tied. We're, we're in a dog fight with freaking Houston. We're a game up on them. We're six and a half out. And it's not the end of the world, like we said, but now you got to chip away again. And we've been trying to chip away for the last few years. Yeah, it's not a good game to play. You don't, you never want to play catch up against Houston. They've proven that time and time again. And, you know, every single year we're going through this. Oh, hey, well, they lost this big piece. They lost Carlos Correa. Oh, they lost George Springer. Oh, they lost, you know. Grinky. Uh, uh, Grinky. There you go. Oh, they lost Garrett Cole. And, you know, they're, they're not going to be as good now. They're not going to be as good. They're, and every single time we're wrong. Yeah, yeah. And we are wrong every single time. And it just makes us look horrible. It makes us look stupid. I mean, and we're not the only ones who are doing that. All the experts are like, well, they lost this guy. Maybe they won't be as good this year. And they almost always are. And it's just. Man, it's frustrating. It's just, I, I'm tired of all of this. I want to start winning again. I'm, I'm not alone. All Angels fans want to start winning again. I mean, you know, you got Halo Weezy over here saying, I'm never going to an Angels game again until we're 10 games over 500. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, Weezy. I'm all, rip, rip, brother. Your next yep. Angels game will probably be when I go to my next Angels game. <laughs> yeah. <And> I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, you know what, maybe next year. Because <laughs> I, you know, I got caught up in it too. I'm going to admit this. Like, as we sit now two games over, um, I looked at it and I was like, okay, we're 10 games over. I'm thinking by the end of June, we could be 16, maybe 17 games over. And then, you know, maybe come into July, we're hovering around maybe 20, close to that. And then we could go on a real run and make ourselves look really good for the postseason. Now I'm like, fuck, dude, like we got to stay in this wild card race to the end of July. And then hopefully we're good. We make some yeah. trades. <laughs> it's like <clears throat> now I'm not confident, bro. And that's how quickly this game can change. Well, that's the beauty in baseball. So let me ask you this then. So fast times under the halo, mm-hmm. you know, AKA Randy said that the angels will lose 30 before they win 30 true or false. They are 27 and 24 as we currently sit recording. Oh, there are three games. They will. I thought there was a, I thought there were two games over the three. 27 and 24. Okay. Um, I would have to say, oh, sorry, 27. They are 27 and 25 going into tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a very good, I think, look, before all this happened again, he said that before the losing streak, I'll credit him. Because he was saying, he was saying, oh, I think they'll get their uh, their twenty second loss before they get their twenty eighth win. I'm like, that's bullshit. That's not going to happen, dude. It happened. Um, so, 
I don't think they're going to reach 30. I think they're going to lose before that, the 30th. They're going to at least win one game on this Phillies. On this Phillies. Uh, they, you know, I don't want to say they're going to win the series. As of right now, I just don't see it happening. I mean, Silta, Silseth is pitching tomorrow. Best of luck to him. I don't think he's going to be able to get it done tomorrow. Lorenzen on Saturday might be the win that I'm hoping for. Mm-hmm. I think Lorenzen's going to prove right there. Like this is going to be his time to prove to major league baseball. that You know what? I am a starting pitcher. Not only am I a starting pitcher, I'm a number two or number three on any rotation. And I think he'll kind of take the game over. I think we're talking quality start. I think we're talking like shutout through like six, maybe even seven before he gets pulled. Okay. I could definitely see that. And I would hope Sandoval would follow that up with a good start as well. Um, but damn, it's it's really I, I just <sighs> yeah, I don't know. It's hard to predict. It's hard to even reach into your halo honk right now. Show me your honks. I'm trying to find my honk right now, and I just can't. You think you ever told John to show him his honks? Hey, John, show me your honks. <laughs> show me your shakies, bro. You know how. You know how depressed I was today for the show? I could not even muster a Nacho Night Award. I couldn't do a, a, a Stamos Award for excellence. I couldn't, dude. I, I just was not in the mood. The Stamos Award for excellence goes to Mark Gubiza <laughs> for always being in such a good mood. Exactly. Always being positive. <laughs> yeah, with the always handsome Mark Gubiza. I'm pretty sure Roger said that, too. He's so handsome. Oh, I know. <laughs> that guy. He's so handsome. <laughs> I like the cut off that yeah. guy's jib. <laughs> if, oh, oh, yeah, right. I'm so caring enough about myself to say, oh, that's a handsome man. But like Roger takes to like a new extreme all the time. He does. Get past a wapo. Yeah, get past a wapo. I'll tell you, yeah. I'll tell you what, Artie. I'm some of these players with their shirts off. Wow, magnificent. <laughs> I'd eat those helmet nachos. <laughs> I'd put cheese on those nachos. <laughs> hey, you know what? The other thing was, um, like I actually listened to Roger because in between the games, they he he even came on there and was like, "This is going to be the shortest sports lodge of the season, maybe of all time, because I only got ten minutes of show, and then we're going to go into the pregame with Terry Smith and Mark Langston." And so, like, that's my kind of sports lunch. Yeah, dude, he did like a just know, enough time for four seven one four ticket ads. Yeah, <laughs> in ten minutes. But the the one thing I took out of his brief show, which I liked it too, that it was brief, the fact that he <laughs> literally he literally went on there and was like, you know, I'm kind of concerned about my angels, and he never says that. You know, he's always Mister Positive and everything. He's like. He's on this eight game streak. It's got to lo- or seven game streak. It's got to it's got to stop right now. I was like, wow, dude. Like, okay, you know. You know, it's funny actually. I think I was listening to that little ten minute stretch too, because if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he talked about the Dodgers and he was like, oh, the Dodgers are on a three game losing streak, but the good news is the Padres, who are you know in second place, are also on a three game losing streak. And I was like, oh, Dodger Lodge strikes again. <laughs> Yes, yes. And yeah, yeah he, he said that. I'm like, this guy doesn't even hide anymore that he's a Dodger fan. He doesn't. And then the other thing was, too, I noticed like last year and, and for like the previous five years, it was always Kurt Gibson's home run ending the intro for the show. Now he does it oh. a little bit earlier in the show or in the intro, and he even gets the part where Vince Scully is like, in a year of the improbable, the impossible yeah. happened. He plays that. Well, don't get me wrong. That's one of the greatest baseball calls of all time. I super iconic, but not for an angel show. Yeah, it does not de- does not belong on our network because again, I've said it for years. I would love for the Dodgers to play an angel highlight or put that in their montage and see what their fans say. So, but we we do yeah. it because Roger Dodger. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, I'm I'm just over it. I'm 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 really just want to see a W right now. This is so freaking frustrating right now. Yep. Teams falling flat on their face, man. They need something here. I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll be the uh, Philadelphia overhyped Philly cheesesteaks, but um, I guess we'll see. What sparks this team faster, real quick? 
a fight or a closed door meeting? Uh, I think it'll be indigestion from the Philly cheesesteaks. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what's gonna wake them up or light something up, or maybe it'll be like the fight for like the toilets. Oh my god! Well, you know what? That's what someone said uh, earlier. Is is uh, man, this team was doing a lot better when guys were going on the DL for uh, the shits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. This team was doing better when they had the Hershey squirts. <laughs> Who was eating at Murray Calendars? Who DoorDash Murray Calendars last night? Oh, that place still open? Yeah, you know what? It's no, funny. no, they're not. Yes, yes, <laughs> they're not open. I'm gonna head on over to the Kmart and then head over to dinner at Murray Calendars. I, I love that because if my daughters were listening, because they don't support me anyway when it comes to baseball, but I'm just saying, okay. when if they were listening, <laughs> they'd be like, "Hey, that's my mom's restaurant," because she's like been a manager and like worked for them for like 20 years. <laughs> and when you said, still, yeah. <laughs> Well, which one does she work? There's not many. Okay, you know what? I probably don't even have to ask which one she works at. I could probably just go on Google and it's like the only one left. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the only ones left. It's uh the one in Whittier. Yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, so in New Jersey, where I stay, there's a Ruby Tuesday attached to the hotel. And I'm like, Ruby Tuesday? That's like a Murray Calendar kind of restaurant. Murray Calendar, Coco's, Ruby Tuesdays. Same, all- same thing. It's all the same. And you could throw Bob Evans in there if you've ever been in the mid- Midwest. <laughs> uh, you know, Bob Evans is also New Jersey. That's a shitty restaurant, bro. Shout out, shout out to Mount Laurel. Oh, yeah, I used to stay there, too. And there was a uh, there was a uh, Bob Evans right there. Actually, you remember a couple months ago when we had Ty Buttry on our show uh, mm-hmm. when we were doing the Instagram Live and he was wearing our T-shirt? Yeah. I ate Bob Evans that night. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did you have the squirts? I that, there was a reason I was recording outside. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to that, there's a reason I'm recording outside. You, you know when Wiener Schnitzel sounds like a better alternative than your restaurant, Bob Evans. You know there's a problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was exactly. faced. I was faced with that dilemma one day, and I I chose uh, Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mini corn dogs. There you go. <laughs> Oh man, uh, that's I asked that question last year. That might be a question to ask again soon for question today. That's a question you can ask every year, and it's going to be different. You know, what fast food restaurant would you describe the Angels as? Oh, yeah. Let me ask you that right now. I'm going to put you on the spot. If you had to describe the Angels right now as a fast food restaurant, what would it be? I'm ready when you are. Um, geez, I have a couple that I would like to put out there, but. Uh... I'd ha- I oh okay I'd have to say what a burger, what a burger has. Oh, here we go with this shit again. <laughs> um, I've owned a house in Texas that I don't even live in for like three weeks, and I'm like, and I'm angry. Where's where's my my Colt forty four? Well, see, see, I would say what a burger has all the hype, like the Angels do. They have the good looking food on the menu, but it doesn't live up to the hype, and it kind of loses your interest right away. That's just. I had to go with a burger. Interesting. I was going to say White Castle for that almost exact same reason. There everyone you go. talks about it and it's overhyped and everyone's like, oh my God, I'm going to stop there on the way to Vegas. It's going to be an attraction. <laughs> and I don't know what kind of voice or accent that was. But um, yeah, and then you finally get it. You wait a long time for it and you're sitting on the toilet the rest of the night like, oh God, yeah. literally praying that it ends. And you know what's you know what's bad about White Castle, real quick. I know we're going into food topic, but hey, honestly, there's not much baseball to talk about. This the last eight <sighs> games has just been embarrassing. So exactly, who can blame us? But I, I will say this though: I remember going to a White Castle in Vegas that one you're talking about, and being unimpressed with their little burger sliders. And then, but then one <laughs> night when I was really depressed and usually what i would do when i was depressed was i'll just hit like the microwave section or something make myself something and i went into the frozen section they had white castle burgers the microwave ones tasted better than the vegas ones dude so 100 (laughs) percent. yeah that's sad yeah i had the microwavable ones as a kid because you know what i mean like your friends would always have them or whatever like you know you have those late night uh, like uh, your friends just staying the night or whatever when you're like a teenager and yeah, yeah you know you guys are up eating you know just crappy food so yeah white castle and video games so uh yeah i guess oh and potato skins uh would yeah, be what my bad. friends and i would do 
not bad. Yeah. So I, I agree with you on the microwave situation. Cause yeah, I had white castle for the first time when uh, I used to serve as Vegas uh, before I gave that territory up to somebody else. So I could take other projects around the country when my traveling really started. And yeah, I stopped at that white castle one time at terribles and um yeah, man, it was literally I had I got food poisoning and then I was like, you know, I'll try it one more time. And I tried it in Chicago because when we landed, it was like one in the morning and there's nothing else open because mm-hmm. there are 24 hours. And man, God, it's just so bad. So bad. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't people love it. it, though. They have like a cult following. And just because they're over there in Harold and Kumar doesn't mean you have to eat there, people. Exactly. It's not it's not worth it, man. I'd rather have Waffle House any day of the week. You know, hey, Waffle House is good. You just have to deal with like extra side shows. Well, yeah, you get fights all the time. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, it's like going to like Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, or it's like <laughs> like when it's like it's like not spending a lot of money for one of those uh you know those ships or those train rides where it's like hey come and uh, take a train ride and t- take a murder mystery. It's like now nah, you get you go to uh you get a combo for like nine bucks at <laughs> Waffle House and you get a free show, dude. It's awesome. Yeah, you get like everything on the menu for like nine dollars. You get like the All Star special comes like the toast, the eggs, the bacon, the sausage. The, hell, they'll give you the whole waffle iron if you want it, <laughs> all for nine dollars. Cheesy. And egg. all you have to deal with is, uh, you know, J- J- Jimmy Joe Ray and you know Don Trell and their friend uh, Pepe, you know, <laughs> over here. And then somebody gets over speared in a debate, and then they start fighting. And you're just kind of there, like, oh, don't get any blood on my waffles. I know. <laughs> It's like you're eating your food and then you hear someone starting to like bicker with somebody else. You're like, oh shit, here we go. Right. <laughs> Can I get a to-go box, please? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get any blood on my on my eggs. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't Good I don't stuff. know, man. I mean, I there's not much else to talk about, man. The angels suck right now. You know, time to post that meme everywhere that says, Oh no, we suck again. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, that's been one of the most used memes for the angels over the last few years but uh we're headed in that direction like 12 times a month so yeah we're headed in that direction again but uh hopefully what i'm hoping is our next show this weekend we have courtney on and we can do a show to where we have something positive to talk about because notice we didn't get into the box scores we didn't get into all the hard nose stuff that we usually do it's just to talk about. Yeah, it was just frustrating. <laughs> too much. I mean, yeah. what are we going to do? Highlight the fact that uh, Trout kept striking out and having overs? It's like, nah. It's, yeah. You know that already. Nothing to talk about there. That's why we do. I, I, I didn't even want to bother going into the box scores. I thought we talked about some of the pitching because that well, was extremely relevant as to part of the problem here. We mm-hmm. talked a little bit about the lineup and the struggles there. But yeah, it just. Let's let's get a win. If we can get a win against the Phillies, I'll be like, okay, hey, a win. <laughs> yeah, because I'm it, not even calling for a series win right now. Don't worry, Roger Lodge will. The Angels are going to win four out of three against the Phillies, <laughs> and oh boy, oh boy, John Stamos and his glorious eyes and his hair are going to come over to my house and we're going to stare romantically <laughs> into each other's eyes. And Artie's going to be like, I doordashed some toothpaste. <laughs> Boy, there that, you go. Your your lock just locks. <laughs> Four out of three, that works. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Artie's definitely the guy who DoorDash's toothpaste, hundred percent, and that's all he does. DoorDash's toothpaste, zero tip, zero dollars. Yeah, zero tip for sure, dude. He's like, he's like, I didn't get this rich by uh, tipping. <laughs> yeah, no tipping, Artie. Exactly. Well, that's all I got for this episode, my man. I'm hoping for the best for our next show. Yeah, well, you can find me here for the last couple of days in my condo crying about the Angels' losses. Mm, we got to get you a W <laughs> before you get out of there, man. Yeah, and you can find Todd crying in his studio about the Angels' losses also. So, But, hey, you're a grandfather, man. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and another one on the way. Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah, very soon. The due date's July 4th, so we'll see. We'll see, an American baby. Yeah, America. <laughs> yeah, America. So, uh, real quick, before we, we head out, how, how is it being a grandfather compared to being a father? People say being a grandfather is way better. Uh, Well, just six days into it, uh, I'm enjoying it because... It's early on. <laughs> yeah. 
it's just holding her was a magical moment for me uh i ain't gonna lie dude i don't care if it takes my street cred if i have any i cried dude um it it was a sweet moment um you don't have any for the record what's that you don't have any street cred for the record but it's fine thank you thank you uh (laughs) well i have minus street cred now um okay there you go but i I Chris street cred yes exactly (laughs) i'm just above him um but no, I, I I cried because I was like, dude, like this is a life I, I pictured, you know, holding my daughter. Uh, she wasn't that small, like like uh, Olivia's six point five pounds when she was born. Um, you know, my daughter was nine pounds, um, almost ten pounds. Okay. Yeah, big baby. Uh, but just the fact that you know she's here, she's a whole new personality. She looks like her mom and dad all the way. It's she's got some even features of my mom. She's got my mom's nose. So I was taken aback by everything. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I'm not responsible for this baby 24 hours. You know, I actually get yeah, to right. come, come and visit when I want to. And I get to spoil her, you know, like, like, it's just, it's weird. I'm only 41, dude. And I'm a grandpa already. So like, I, it's crazy. I, I don't know what to feel sometimes. So I'm just, I'm like, I'm like a team trying to find its way. I, um, I'm taking it day by day. Yeah, I think uh, I think you and I are kind of the same. I mean, you know, I was I'm 27. I have a seven year old. I always wanted to be a young father. I wanted to grow up with my kids. I had friends whose parents were like in their 50s and they were like, you know, out of seven, touch. eight. Yeah. And I'm just, yeah, exactly. Out of touch. They had no idea what was going on. They didn't know about the struggles of, you know, having to deal with cell phones or like social media when that stuff came along as we got older. And, you know, they weren't growing up with their kids. You know, they couldn't play catch with their kids. And I think you kind of wanted the same thing. I feel like you wanted to be a young father, too. So you could also grow up with your kids. So, you know, it'll be cool for you to grow up with your grandchild because you're still a very young man yourself. You know, 41 years old, you still got a lot of time left in the ticker. You, you still got a lot of stuff to learn yourself. So, yeah, that's going to be awesome for you, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to live it next to you. And, you know, kind of experience it through, through the photos and, you know, obviously you and I have a good relationship. So, yeah, congratulations, man. I mean, sure, it's been awesome for you to I've seen all the support coming through the messages. So it's probably been even better for you. Yeah, I appreciate it, man, because it's been a, a rough year or so. So <clears throat> with her yeah. coming along right now and then Mike is going to be on his way. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And you're right. I mean, uh, there it's 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 uh, it remind, takes me back to when. You know, my girls were young and you're going to experience that with Tanner as he grows up, you know, like, you know, maybe by the time he's like 20, you're going to be about my age. And, uh, you know, he may have a kid or he may not, but but you're going to be close with him. And that's why I was I was I'm close with my daughters. You know, my daughters like we were friends a lot because, you know, we did a lot of things, especially when they got to their teenage years and they kind of understood what, you know, I, I was going through or you know, they, they, they got to understand me more as a person and not just their father. And like, we've always been close and had good conversations. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to this next chapter with a, with a grandkid for sure. And I appreciate the words, man. No problem, man. Cheers to that. Yes, sir. All right. So this has been a great show, uh, for Todd Fox and the incomparable. Fernando and the rest of our depressed Halos in the infield stuff. Take it easy. Bye.